So this is your session, so feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, the first thing is when you pull an RBPC out of the box, you're looking at something that looks something like this. You're all familiar with it. You've installed a few of these already. One of the biggest concerns that I have when you're starting an installation is to lay <coughs> things out correctly. Uh, the first concern in my mind is this is no longer just a bare bones clutch control. It's also a message center. So try to find a spot to locate this where this is readily visible to the operator because it's, it is telling useful information on the screen that, that you need to get to pretty easily. So I know a few, at first few, maybe the controls ended up on the side of the machine. We might want to revisit that as we move further downstream, put them in a convenient location. Every RBPC looks the same, is interchangeable. The backside, every connection is made via Phoenix uh, terminal blocks. These blocks unplug, you hook your wires up, you plug them back in. So that's important uh, part of your installation. Be neat in the beginning. Use like 16 gauge machine tool wire. Make sure your wires are not frayed. Put them in correctly. And I want you to be aware at the back side of every Phoenix block that's an input, there is a red LED there. So for example, if you're pushing pound buttons and they're not stroking the machine, the first thing to look is in this cutout have somebody push the push button and they will light up red. Okay, so the pound buttons, the foot switch circuits, the light curtain circuits, all the inputs, the, the actual inputs, the proximity switch circuit would all have a corresponding red LED. A lot of guys don't know because it's inside the box that that's there, but that's a very useful um, tool when you're trying to um, do your uh, troubleshooting or your initial installation of the system. <clears throat> Like for these guys to know that they got to look like down in that crack. There, the, there's a cutout in the sheet metal, and there's a surface mount LED on the inside. It's it's pretty bright. You can see it. You don't have to look too hard, but you got, it's not going to be. It, you're going to have to look into that cutout. Your wires might be covering some of them, but you'll be able to use it as a. It's nothing but a continuity checker. When the input's turned on, it's going to light up red, and when the input's turned off, it's not going to. It's going to be off. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Uh, the second thing is when you're installing this device um, and you have your mounting done, <coughs> ultimately the RBPC utilizes these relays at the back. Th these are force guided contact safety relays. They connect to wires on this terminal strip. These relays are controlling both halves of the press dual safety valve. So of course, you have to have a dual safety valve on the press. Um, but you are powering the, that with the output relays in this device. So when we supply the unit, every, every RBPC comes with this little bag in the box. And what you see are these two blue devices are called quench arcs. These need to be installed across any inductive load that you're turning on and off every stroke. And of course, the safety valve is the biggest inductive load on your press. Every time you engage the clutch and disengage the clutch, that relay is turning on and off. So make sure you install these right at the safety valve. Go to the actual physical safety valve, identify both the solenoids, and put these devices as close as you can to the safety valve. It's really important. Wiring it back here is not effective. You need to go as close to the safety valve as you possibly can. There's two of them because you have a dual safety valve. There's two solenoids. One side connects to the hot of the valve and the other side connects to the neutral. And put them there. It will do two things. The first thing is it suppresses the electrical surges that are created by a solenoid valve. So that's a good thing. It makes your electronics not get zapped over and over and over again by spikes. The second thing it does which is even more significant from a maintenance point of view, is it extends the life of the relay contacts that are turning on and off that solenoid valve. Say, how can a little device like this make a difference? It's like night and day. If you don't use them, these relays are turning on a solenoid on and off all day long, they're going to wear out faster. And you're better off to be proactive, suppress the source of noise, rather than letting all your electronics on the press, the control, 
the light curtains, if you use ergonomic pound buttons, the, um, if you have a servo feed, all those electronic devices don't want to be spiked over and over and over and through the course of a day with, with electrical spikes. These suppressors will do a great job. If you find that you're using other inductive devices on the press, for example, you put in a big scrap chopper and it's got a large solenoid on it and you're turning it on and off every stroke of the machine, it's a good idea to throw, get some more of these and put one across that solenoid. If you've got a spray lubricator that's solenoid driven and you're turning it on and off periodically with the press, it's a good idea to suppress that. If you're proactive, you'll save a lot of maintenance calls, troubleshooting calls. You'll be finding your electronics will run years more trouble free with the correct precautions being taken. So I always stress this to um, everybody when I'm doing training on this. And also, we're supplying two small devices, a red and a black device. These are solid state relays. Now, these have nothing to do with the safety valve, but they happen to be in the same little envelope. If you look at the back of the RVPC, I identified these four relays as being, they're, they're listed here too. Safety relay one, safety relay two, which are your outputs. There's a fault relay in here, and there's a mute relay. This is all to do with the light curtain mute and these two are controlling the safety valve. But right to the right next to them, there are four little black relays. These are unpluggable, fuel serviceable relays. What these are, are the four built-in programmable limit switches. Every RBPC comes with four built-in programmable limit switches. These can be used to turn on and off pieces of equipment, such as your ear blow off, your spray lubricator, your scrap chopper, your feed. So instead of putting a limit switch and turning it on and off with a crank that you have to climb up and down the ladder to make adjustments, you can actually use the programmable limit switches in here to turn on and off external pieces of equipment. They're there. Now, these are four small mechanical relays. They're going to, if you're turning on and off something like a counter or a digital input to a controller, the, the feed window for a servo feed, these relays will last indefinitely. But any mechanical relay has a finite life. And the more of a load you run through it, the life is inversely proportional. In other words, the more load you run, the shorter the number of cycles that it can turn on and off that load before it corrodes and pits the contacts. So, if you're running applications where you're turning on and off solenoids or any high current device, you could use either the AC or the DC solid state relay that we supply spares. You can unplug these and plug these into the same socket. So now the mechanical relays have been replaced with solid state relays. Solid state relays will last for many years of trouble free operation. The reason why we don't put them in standard unless you ask for them is because, because they're solid state, you have to know what you're controlling with them. So if it's an AC solenoid, you need an AC solid state relay. If it's a DC device, it's not going to work with a solid state relay. You have to then put the appropriate relay in the socket. There's two types, AC or DC solid state. A mechanical relay can turn on and off anything. It's a switch. It's a dry switch. So we supply them with the dry switches, but we'll, we'll give you any combination when you order the unit that you want, and you can always buy extra replacements and plug them into those sockets. Later, I'm going to sh actually demonstrate how to program the programmable limit switches. So when the time comes that you want to use it, you're going to find that this is such a, more, such a more powerful tool than what you're already using it for. There's things that you haven't even approached yet with your installations that might make the whole job of uh, automating the press a lot easier. Yeah, actually, so that, that's actually, part of it. that was going to be one of my questions because the next machine we do over there, I needed a way to activate the feeder on it. Well, and I haven't done that so you, far. By the time I'm done today, you will have a quick run through of how to program uh, a programmable limit switch and how to wire into it. But these relays that are in this bag, I, I, I go into some maintenance departments and find they've installed a dozen of these and there's a dozen of these sitting in the guy's toolbox and then I have to have the lecture after the fact that they've already chewed up relays and this is why I started this presentation. The first concern is always the proper installation of the product. Be neat, get your wires, get, make sure you have earth grounds coming in here correctly, 
use your suppressor devices, be proactive instead of reactive, and it's going to save you a lot of machine downtime. Okay? So once you have this unit on the machine, the base unit on the machine, you've got the suppressors across your safety valve and you've wired those connections in, you have to wire your safety device in, whether it's a light curtain or a barrier guard with interlock switches, we can do both. And I'm going to show you later in this presentation how to select between a light curtain and a barrier guard. We can handle both inputs. That needs to be wired in. Before you power this unit up, all these things should be done. Your e-stops, your top stops, your palm buttons, your light curtains, all the connections should be made. We supply with each unit a little book with a wiring diagram in here. We also supply a DVD that has three different levels of manuals in there. There's a user manual for the operator, there's a setup manual for the setup people, and there's a supervisor a manual that covers everything. And in the manual, it tells you what level everybody has. So my, in, in essence, there are three levels of security. One for the operator, one for middle management setup people, and one for safety and the installers. When you guys put these in, you have to go to the, you have to have the power to make adjustments that you would never want the operator or the setup people to be making. So there are three levels of security. The operator has the simplest, which is a hard key. The supervisor and the setup man will have passwords. And I will be getting into that shortly of how to access all the different levels of menus in the device. <coughs> in every kit, every kit we supply, we also supply a resolver. This one happens to be, you can see the shaft is pretty big. It's a three quarter inch keyed shaft. The body of all our resolvers are exactly the same. The mounting is the same. It's the shaft and the bearing size that determine. If you're using a resolver on a sprocket and chain driven system or a, a direct couple to a crankshaft, you want to use the three quarter inch shaft. If you have an existing uh, rotary cam box and you're going to leave it there and there's a back shaft on the cam box and you want to just piggyback the resolver to the back of the shaft or you have pillow blocks arrangement already dry with your sprocket and chain on your machine, this, you could pr feasibly use this, the 3 8 resolver. There's a slight price advantage on the 3 8 inch resolver, but the difference is the 3 8 inch resolver never wants to see an axial load of more than 30 or 40 pounds. In other words, you don't want loads pushing perpendicular to the, act, the shaft because it's eventually going to, you've got bearings on both, on both ends of this resolver, there's bearings internally, there's two bearings. But you have, if your weight's out here, it acts like a lever on that first bearing and you're going to snap shafts. The, so 30 to 40 pounds maximum axial load on a 3 8 inch resolver. So this is why we're relying on the, the cam box to be your pillow block or create a pillow block arrangement. Or if you're using a rubber timing belt with cog teeth, again, there's never going to be enough axial load on a 3 8 inch resolver. But anything else, Lovejoy coupler, a sprocket and chain drive where you're a direct couple to the end of the shaft, you definitely want to go with this because this can handle in excess of 100 pounds of axial load. The bearing is just that much more massive. Um, you can help yourself by mounting these on spring-loaded bases and so you're minimizing some of the effect, but again, under a normal installation, this would be a pretty bulletproof resolver to be using. There's a military plug at the back side, obviously, bayonet, snap the cable in. The other end of the cable simply wires to a, a Phoenix block. That's the back of the RBPC. That happens to be Mark Resolver, and it's shown in the wiring diagram. So now you've got the resolver mounted and wired into this device. The last part you're going to need to con be concerned about is there is a one proximity switch cam that we supply with this system. I have one here. I'm going to pull out of the box. It's a simple proximity switch. We also supply 